year. So Merry Christmas, first of all. Let me express that to you. Merry Christmas. Don't miss tonight. Don't miss tonight. Come back at 5 o'clock. If you're still in town, I know some of you may be traveling, but it's going to be amazing. You, our team. And can we show some Christmas love for the praise team and the tech team back there? I tell you what. Man, they have worked so hard and been so faithful. And they, they do it for the glory of God, not for the applause of people, but... Uh, just really so, so thankful and amazed that I get to serve alongside such a wonderful team. So Merry Christmas, and uh, for those of you who gathered here in person, those of you watching online right now from, from home right here in, in the community or literally all around the country, maybe even around the world, we're so delighted you've joined us. We're in the midst of a Christmas series called Come Home for Christmas, and it's really just a collection of messages um, with the same theme, uh, really highlighting the desire that I believe exists within every single person here today and in, in within the sound of my voice. And we're talking about w looking into God's Word to see what His response is to all of that. So it's always an exciting time here at JC Naz. Amen? Always, all year long. But if you're visiting with us for the first time or tuning in for the first time online, uh, December's an especially exciting time. And so we, you picked a really good time to visit is what I'm saying. We just pray that you'll feel at home here and you'll come back and you'll feel connected and you'll journey with us as a church family. There's a place for you here and you'll journey with us as a church family into the new year because we have a God that can do the impossible, amen? He, he, there's, he knows no boundaries and I just believe we're going to see God move in some fresh new ways in and through us. We're going to see a whole lot of lives change on Fort Riley and, and in our schools and in our community and, and maybe in areas that have been sticking points. We're going to see God move and, and work through us in ways that um, are going to bring him a lot of glory and a lot of people to him. So I'm excited for that. Um, let me just ask you as we kick off here, are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas? I mean, ready or not, right? Five days from now, it's it's here. It's going to be on us. And uh, I, I was wondering also uh, this question: when, when does it feel like Christmas for you? When does it begin to feel like you know? When does it kind of click? When when do you get that sense of joy and excitement? Like, okay, now I'm ready. Now it feels like Christmas. Maybe for some of you, for some of you crazy people, that started like in October. Right? Come on, fess up. I saw some of your social media posts. You, you're a very special part of our church family. We love you very much, and we're glad you're here. But uh, for some of you, you started really early. That's fine. That's okay. It's whatever. Uh, for others of you, it's, it's, you know, maybe your family has a special tradition that you kick off the Christmas season with. And when that happens, you know, maybe it's, it's watching those classic Christmas movies. Maybe that's what triggers it for you and begins that in your heart, you know, like, like Elf. Or um, it's a wonderful life, or die hard, right? I mean, I think I, I think I heard that someone beat me to the punch, right? <laughs> classic, classic movies. Or maybe it's going to go look at Christmas lights. Amy and I, we've been, we 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 have done this year what we told you never to do: get so crazy scheduled and busy. We haven't taken our kids yet on a drive-through Christmas thing, but Amy and I got to go, right? And so that was fun. That was already. Uh, the Christmas spirit was already building in our hearts, but that was extra special. Or maybe it's the first snow. If so, you're going to be waiting a long time, I think, sadly. We got a little skiff early in the year, so maybe that was enough, hopefully, to put you, you know, in, in motion with that. Or maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's the Hallmark Christmas marathons, right? When that, how many, come on, men, how many of that's going on at your house? I can't see you out there. Anybody want to testify? We have a little support group after the service if you want to get together and... Yeah, you know, um, my, my wife hates it when I spoil the endings of the movie, which is really impossible with a Hallmark movie, right? Because it's 30 seconds in, you already know what's going to happen. You know, the guy and the gal that meet and they don't like each other and they're polar opposites, they're the ones that are going to fall in love after she dumps her rich boyfriend in the city and after they decorate the Christmas tree on Main Street in the freshly fallen snow, right? <laughs> but my wife hates it. <laughs> she, she hates it when I say that. It ruins the ending. So I've noticed lately she's been watching it on her phone with her earbuds in. So she just, she's a closet Hallmark Christmas wife. She don't want, it, she don't want me interfering at all with the, with the love story. So, uh, so I don't know. I don't know um, when it clicks for you. I don't know what triggers that, when it happens, where you're at and all that. But here's, here's what I believe we all desire deep down. This is what I believe all of our planning and all of our hustle and bustle and all the decorating and all the preparation, this is what I believe it's all aimed at. Here, here it is. We all have this desire that somehow, some way, somewhere, before it's all said and done, we will end up experiencing a moment like this 
take a look at this. With this kind of vibe going on, just, just soak in that for a moment. Isn't there something within you that just says, ah, oh, that's, that's, that's nice, boy. I, I, I want that. I, I wish we could have that, right? You look at that, and, and can't you just picture yourself there? It, it's Christmas Eve, let's say, and you got young kids. They're, they're all asleep at home, and, and they're asleep in their beds. Or maybe if you're later, later in life, you've got your kids coming over the next day, and they're bringing the grandkids. You're going to have the big meal. The stockings are all hung just perfectly. you got to love that fireplace, right? Can, you almost can hear the crackling and the popping of the, popping of the wood and the warmth and the light and, the, and it's flickering off the perfectly wrapped presents and decorated tree sitting there. And, and we just look at that, right? And it brings up all these feelings of peacefulness and, and joy. And, and, and here's why. Here's why I think that when most people look at that picture, they get this desire in them that builds. It says, wow, well, wouldn't that be nice? Because here's what happens. It exposes the longing we have in our lives for everything to be just right. For everything to be just right. A longing, a deep longing that we can't even quite express for everything to be the way it should be. For my kids to be the way they should be. For my marriage to be just right. For my job to be just right. For our life and our, our, our personal lives and our family life to be right on track and we're all on point and we're all heading in the same direction and we're all meeting our goals in life and everything's ending up where we feel it should be and, and everyone's getting along, right? And everyone gathered in the home or gathered around the table is happy and everyone's together and no one's mad and no one's gone and no one refuses to come and no one has to stay away. And, you know, everything is just right. And, and I, I believe every single person deep down has this longing, especially this year, perhaps, more than ever, at this time of year even. Now, now listen, I'm not saying that, that desiring that is wrong. I'm not saying wanting to live out that scene or create that scene or experience that is a wrong thing to, to desire. We, we long for those moments, but here's what I want to do today. I want to challenge you just a little bit to look a little bit deeper behind the reason why we do all we do, especially at this time of year. I want us to really take an honest look in all that's said and done here today as we look into the Word an honest look at what it is we're really searching for, what it is we're really longing for and Again, as I, as I shared last week, there's this longing inside of us that I think gets elevated for good reason. This time of year, we have this desire to be home for Christmas, home for Christmas, for everything to be just right. And again, I don't think that's wrong. In fact, here's what I believe. I believe God's word shows that God's behind that. That's a God desire because God himself put that in us. But really, what I hope we see today is that's only a dim reflection. Our desire for this for this is only a dim reflection of what we really long for, in fact. You can take that down if you'd like to, that picture. It's only a dim reflection of what we really long for. In fact, what we were created for by God himself to be with him, to be home with God. And so I, I don't know everybody's journey. I don't know where you're at in this faith um, journey with Christ. Um, and So I don't know how much time you spend in the Bible, but uh, let me just try to give you like a 30,000-foot tour here and show you this theme, how it runs all throughout the Word of God. And for example, in the first few pages of the Bible, in the very beginning in Genesis, we see God's desire to be at home with the first man and the first woman that He created. He created to be, them to be at home with Him. He created them to have a relationship with Him, to experience this unbroken fellowship with Him. And they didn't have a home like what we saw in the picture. They didn't have a home like this. They, they were in a garden, after all. And in that garden, guess what? God Himself walked with them and talked with them, and they shared experiences together, and they enjoyed fellowship together. And yet, tragically, we know, as you keep reading, you don't get very far in the story before you realize that their lack of trust in the Father led them into sin. They fell into temptation. They did the only thing that God said they should not do, and he had a good reason for telling them that. And they gave into temptation, and they ate from the fruit of the tree that God said not to eat from. And as we learned last week, giving into temptation always brings consequences. And the consequences for them was they were expelled from the garden. God says, they have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I cannot allow them I just cannot allow them to eat from the tree of life as well and live forever, ever. And so God expelled them from the garden. 
and sin entered their heart, and now the sin nature begins to spread throughout humanity and this sinful inclination to be my own God, to do what I think is right in my own eyes, this spread throughout humanity, and things were very rough. For the first people, that there was division between the pair. There was division in their family. In fact, there are two sons, Cain and Abel. You might remember those names. They were out in a field one day, and because of great jealousy and deep resentment, Cain killed Abel. We have the very first murder ever recorded in history. And, and even though wickedness began to grow and people grew more and more distant from God, here's the deal. God never stopped seeking them. God never stopped calling his people back home, calling them back to a relationship with himself. And so you journey on into the Old Testament and you begin to read the Old Testament. Some of those parts we have a hard time understanding, right? And all these strange stories and experiences really are all summed up in this way. They're all about the great links that God went to in all those seasons and history of life to, to express his covenant faithfulness and his commitment to restore the relationship with him that had been broken with his people and people like us. And time and time we see it, though. He, God kept calling. God kept inviting them, and they kept turning away. They turned to idolatry. They, they ran to, and they put their trust in other nations. And, and again, they experienced the consequences Many times they found themselves very distant from God and even distant from the homeland, the promised land that he had led them to and promised that they would be, be their very own. And they even were led into exile where other nations dominated them and captured them and enslaved them because of their lack of trust in God. But again, God never gave up. The whole time God was there saying through the prophets and in so many other ways, come back to me, return to me, come home. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want, I want us to be a, a family, God was saying. And then we see this radical moment in history. At just the right time, the Bible says, God sent Jesus, his one and only son, to this earth. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas time. And in John chapter 1, John, one of the disciples, says that Jesus came not to sit on a throne. He came not to be an earthly king to, to, to rule over us with an iron fist. But actually, our God entered into our mess. He entered into all that, all that destruction and all the consequences that our sin had caused. Even though we rejected him, he came to us and he took on flesh and blood. And he actually chose to dwell among us, to live among us. It's a miracle, right? Our God chose to leave the perfection of heaven and make his home with us so that then through faith we could experience being home with him and all those that we know who have put their faith in him, we could experience being home with him in heaven forever someday. That's what our God did. And this is what Jesus, of course, tells us so clearly. We're going to make a pit stop here in John 14 on our way to John chapter 4, okay? So if you want to find that, Jesus tells us this so clearly in John chapter 14. And the context of this, of course, is a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples and he's reassuring them, right? He's, he's comforting them because very soon he knows he's going to go to the cross and he's going to lay his life down. No one takes it from him, of course, but he's going to lay it down voluntarily. He's told his disciples all about this. He's told them he's going away because he's going to be killed by sinful men. He's going to be buried. He's going to be raised from the dead, but he's going to return to heaven, and they're more than a little concerned about this because for several years now, they have experienced such closeness with Jesus, right? They have experienced such fellowship with Jesus, whom they've come to know as the Messiah, right? The Savior of the world. And, and they've become like a family, and they just can't bear the thought of all this coming to an end. And so they're very troubled at heart. But Jesus says, you don't have to, you don't have to be fearful about that. You don't have to worry about that because actually it's going to get much better than you could ever imagine. They don't understand this. But he reassures them with these words. I love this in verse 2. He says, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you. Or, or excuse me, if, I, if this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, he says, I will come and get you. I, I will come, right? Just like I came the first time. I'm going to come again. I'm going to come and get you so that you may always be where I am. That's the longing of our father for you this Christmas experience this closeness with him for now and for all eternity. So hear those words, take those to heart. Now let me tell you, let me tell you what every person on the planet is longing for this Christmas. Every person in the planet is longing for this, whether they admit it or not, whether they're aware of it or not, whether they can articulate it or not, whether they become angry at you when you 
bring this up in a conversation, and some people do. Listen, here's what's true of every person. God put inside every person he's ever created a desire for eternity. The Bible says he stamped eternity on our hearts. This deep desire to be in a relationship with God, to be at home with our Father in heaven forever. And so God sends Jesus to this earth to communicate in the clearest way possible that he is willing. He's willing to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. He's willing to enter into our sin and our shame and our mess. You understand this? Every other religion in the world says you have to make your way to God. You have to be good enough. You have to try harder. You have to make more sacrifices. You have to, but God knew that we could never do that. And so he says, you can never make your way to me. So guess what? I'm coming home to you. (laughs) I'm going to make my home with you. And he entered into this mess of a world and he gave his life on a cross and he paid the price for our forgiveness and our salvation with his very own life so that we could experience the, the freedom of forgiveness, the free gift of forgiveness for every sin we've ever committed and so that we can experience a real relationship, a lasting relationship with him, not only for a brief time here in this life, but for all eternity. Now, some of you, some of you might be thinking, okay, I kind of, I kind of get this. I kind of, I'm aware that I have this desire to be home this Christmas and I have this, I realize that I have this longing in my heart. I sense that. I've sensed it for a a long time now, perhaps some of you would say, not just longing for some picture-perfect living room with presents and stockings and a fireplace and family, but I realize that I, I really have a desire to be at home with God, to be at peace with God. But you may be saying this morning, maybe someone's listening online right now, maybe you just tuned in and you don't even know why, and you're saying, but I have a hard time getting my mind around that. I'm having a hard time getting there to that picture because Because as you think of the idea of home, for some of you, there's a lot of pain attached to that. There's a lot of baggage. Because home for you maybe wasn't a a peaceful place, and it wasn't a blessed place, and it wasn't a joyful place. Maybe there was a lot of brokenness in your home. There was a lot of division in your home. There was a lot of loneliness and pain, perhaps, in your home. And and a part of you would say, I'm excited that Jesus wants me. I'm excited that he made it possible to be at home with him forever, but there's some challenges, you understand, when I think about that. Listen, I understand that. That's very understandable, but you need to realize this. On this earth, on this earth, in this life, there's no perfect homes. There's no perfect families. The only perfect home that we'll ever experience is the one that our risen Savior is preparing for us right now as we speak, and he's faithfully doing that work. And again, it's not wrong to want to have the perfect Christmas for you and your family and all that goes with that. But we have to get to this place of understanding and awareness that because of our sin, because of the sinful nature in our hearts, because we live in a fallen world, there's no perfect Christmases. And there's no perfect families free from all disappointment and challenges and sorrows. And here's really, I think, what makes Christmas sometimes so painful for so many Although it's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, although it's supposed to be the happiest season of all, right? There's this idea from some of the Hallmark Christmas movies. There's this idea out there from the commercialization of Christmas. There's this idea that gets floated out in the, in the air, and we, we absorb it, we latch onto it. There's this idea from all the friends that we have, the friends that we have that post on all their social media news feeds, all their perfectly filtered, edited pictures that only show the best side of life. And when we see that, we say, my goodness, everybody else seems to be experiencing the perfect Christmas. Everybody else seems to have the perfect family. Everybody else seems to have the perfect life, but, but I'm not experiencing that. And that's why there's this angst, I think, in a lot of people. I, I, I mean, I'm experiencing a great deal of disappointment, you may say, at Christmas time. And maybe every Christmas we feel that way. The truth be told, there's a lot of families that aren't going to be together this Christmas. It has not a thing in the world to do with COVID or social distancing, or CDC guidelines. The reason a lot of families aren't going to be together this Christmas, truth be told, is because of grudges and offenses and past unforgiveness that has just festered and lingered and remained unresolved for years. And, and, and even if some families are going to be all in the same home or even in the same, same table, 
for a lot of families, there's distance, isn't there? There's, there's tension, and everyone can sense it. Everyone knows the history there. But a lot of people choose to put on a smile and just duck their heads and ignore it. Because, listen, we all long for this magical moment, right? We long for, if only for a little while, we, we want the perfect Christmas, right? We want things to be just right at home. We want everything to be just right. And, and I wonder this week as I thought about this, I wonder if this longing is behind some of the sentiment that we often hear this time of year. Of some people say, I wish it was Christmas all year long, right? I wish it would just be Christmas all year long. You know, I wish, I just wish that some of the glimpses we get in this time of year of peace and on earth and goodwill towards people and homes filled with laughter and love and joy and unity and authentic, caring relationships... We have this longing. I wish I could just characterize the whole year. And we try so hard to cling on to that and, and bottle that up and hold on to it as long as we can. And here's why I think that is, okay? Here's why I think we all have this longing and why, again, so many of us, perhaps this time of year, feel kind of, some people say blue. Some people have this, like, tug on their heart, like, oh, I just, I, I should be happy, but I don't know why. And Listen, if you're asking, why do I feel the things I do at this time of year? Why have I been feeling like this for a long time? Why do I experience so much challenge at Christmas time? Here's what it could be, okay? Here's what it could be. Would you take a look at this equation with me? Look at this. This is as much math as you're ever going to get in a sermon, okay? But listen, here it is. Here's the truth. We have this longing. We have this longing inside all of us that God put there. And we're asking the question, what can we solve for X that will somehow satisfy this longing? What can I put right there in the place of X that will lead to what I deeply desire in, in my life, in my heart? And a lot of people, a lot of people, maybe even some of you have experienced this, some people listening right now, a lot of people go through life grasping and looking and searching hard and, and chasing after something they, they know something's missing, but they don't know what it is. So they look for whatever this life will offer and promise them, and they grab a hold of it, and they put it there, hoping it will truly satisfy, that it will truly fulfill, that it will truly last, that it will somehow, some way, if only for a moment, lead them to true joy, peace, love, true, true hope. Well, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to show you from God's Word what God Himself said about X. I want to show you from Scripture what X is. So turn with me in your Bible, if you have it, or look it up on your device. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We're going to look at a very amazing story. On the surface, this story doesn't appear, though, to have any kind of Christmas connection. But I promise you where this story ends up has everything, I'm telling you, everything to do with Christmas. Because what happens here is this woman in the story that we're going to hear about, she ends up having this life-transforming revelation that comes from a conversation that Jesus himself, the Savior that we celebrate at Christmas, actually initiates with her. She ends up having this life-changing encounter and experiencing the gift of our Savior that we celebrate this year. And you know something? This is where Jesus wants to lead every single person here today to, if you haven't experienced it already. So John chapter 4, John chapter 4, hope you found it. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the fourth gospel. And what I want to do here is I just want to highlight some of the story. I just want to summarize some of it. And then I want to read the heart of the story with you today. Here's the setting. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. They, they traveled everywhere. Their only mode of transportation was foot. And they're going to all these villages and all these regions. And they're telling everyone they can the good news that God has come. That Jesus himself is God and he's come to do something for us that we could never ever do for ourselves so that we can truly be home with him forever. And again... In this encounter that he has with this Samaritan woman, he's letting her know, and he's letting all of us know this morning, listen, if you're wondering what X is, if you're wondering what the missing piece is, what's missing from your life, this shows you so clearly what Jesus desires for you and what he alone can provide. So John chapter 4, Jesus is traveling from place to place. He goes to a little village on his journey. He goes through a village called Sychar. It's in the region of Samaria. That'd be saying like we're passing through um, Harrington or we're passing through Junction City in the Flint Hills, okay, this larger region. And, and John tells us that Jesus was a little weary from the journey. Isn't it amazing that although he was all God, he was also 100% man. He got tired, we know from scriptures. He got hungry. He felt pain. 
He, he, all these things he experienced just as we are, yet he was without sin, the Bible tells us. And Jesus tells us as he's tired, he sits down beside a well, and, and lo and behold, there's a lady that shows up in the middle of the day. This is not the normal time that people, usually women, would go to draw water, but we learn some things about this woman later on through the story in her conversation with Jesus that she's made some questionable choices in her past. She's got some relationships that maybe are a little, you know, um, would not um, cause her to be very accepted by the rest of the community. And so it seems like there's this longing for her to kind of avoid the, spot, the social spotlight. So she comes in the middle of the day. And this is when Jesus is sitting there. He happens to be sitting there resting, and this is what happens. Verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? John gives a little footnote in parentheses there. It says uh, the disciples had gone into town to buy some food. They were hungry. It's lunchtime, okay? The Samaritan woman asked him, you're, you're, you're a Jew. Clearly, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And again, we get a little insight from John that Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now you say, why is that? There's a lot of cultural background and a lot of history that's behind that statement that John makes that the people of this day would have been very familiar with. We have to catch up. There's a lot of history, too much to tell, but just know this, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the nation of Israel was divided into two parts, a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. The southern kingdom was known as Judah. Its capital was Jerusalem. The northern kingdom was known as Israel, okay? We, we don't know it all as Israel today, but the northern kingdom was Israel. Its capital was Samaria, okay? And for hundreds of years, these two existed separately, and there was a growing division, a growing hostility between these two kingdoms for, for lots of reasons, okay? Um, but it grew and it grew into almost a hatred from each other, Okay? And so what happened is these people that lived in the region of Samaria, they were conquered in a point in time of their history, conquered by um, the Assyrians, a people known as the Assyrians. And so the Assyrians did what a lot, of, a lot of people that desired to rule the world did and conquer kingdoms did in that day. It was very common. They would take people out of their homeland, scatter them throughout their empire so they couldn't unite, they couldn't come together and ever rebel against them. They could indoctrinate them by their customs and their, their, um, just their, their cultural ways, okay? And then they would leave some of the people there, but they would bring their people in and put them there in that hometown. And, and they would intermix. And they would intermarry and have families together. And that's what happened with the people in the northern the Israelites there. They started over a period of time, began to intermarry. They began to have children. They began to raise families. And they became these half-Jewish people, half, Assyri half Assyrians. And the other Jewish people in the country, most other Jewish people looked at them and despised that. They saw them as totally spiritually corrupt and compromised because God had said never to do that, never to intermarry with foreign countries, especially idolatrous pagan countries like Assyria. It'll only lead you astray. And so they did that, and it, it just this, this hatred grew. They, they knew them. This language would be shocking today and totally inappropriate, but to kind of give you an idea how they viewed these people, they, they talked about them as half-breeds. They despised them almost at the level of dogs. They weren't even at that level. They were just, the Samaritans were totally hated and rejected by other Jewish people. In fact, you see this show up really clearly in Jesus' life. His critics were coming at him one day, and the Pharisees accused Jesus of being a Samaritan. That was like the worst slap in the face that you could give to somebody if they were Jewish. They said, you're a Samaritan. And what they were slandering him as is being a half-breed who was born of an unfaithful mother. See, and again, in that day... Samaritans were totally despised and hated and rejected. But isn't it amazing, given all that, all those bears, all that prejudice, look where our Savior is. Look what he's doing in the midst of all this. He's striking up a conversation intentionally with a Samaritan woman. And she must have thought, my goodness, man, you are, you must be new to town. <laughs> have you, you don't know this. I mean, we, people like us, don't associate men and women in the middle of the day a Jew, a Samaritan, this is not how it works, but isn't it great? Jesus says, look, your background is no barrier to me. Your demographics does not deter me from showing you the love of God, amen? And he shows up intentionally, and, and he's not phased in the least by her comments, and he knows exactly what, he created her, hello. He's the creator of the world. He just keeps right on going. Jesus answered her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God, 
Man, I love that phrase. I love that statement. If you underline things in your Bible, boy, underline that star, that highlight that. If you knew the gift of God, you wouldn't be trying to solve for X by chasing after all this stuff, lady. You wouldn't be trying to cram your life with all these things of the world. And I pray that if you haven't experienced it already, I'm talking to us now. If you haven't experienced it already, you will not leave here this morning. You'll not log off this morning on the live feed without opening your heart up to and receiving the gift that he's talking about right here, the gift that only Jesus makes possible. And, and, and so he talks about this. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is, not just the gift, but the giver, right? That's where Jesus really wants to get this lady to the point of knowing the giver, right, knowing him. And who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water, right? So, so like so many other times in Jesus' ministry, he's talking on this level, and, and we as people are down here, he's talking on the spiritual and the eternal level, and people are oftentimes very confused in their conversations with Jesus because they're focused on the, the physical and the natural, just what they see right in front of them. And, and we see this come up. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and, and the well is very deep, and and where can you get this living water? She, she doesn't even comprehend. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Again, a lot of history involved here, but she's reaching way back into her heritage, way back into the history, the, the patriarchs, right? The, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, are you greater than, no one would claim that, right, on their own. Are you greater than them, Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons? You know, Jacob had these 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel, this is and his livestock, and, and, and Jesus answered. And Jesus answered in this way. Listen, we're talking this morning about what every person on the planet longs for. We're talking about, even at Christmas time, what, what, the, the times we find ourselves sometimes drawing from the wrong wells and sometimes running to the wrong sources that can never, ever, ever satisfy beyond the temporary moment. This is what Jesus is pointing out to her. He says, listen, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, <laughs> give me this water. So she's getting really excited now. Can you sense it? Give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. In other words, this woman is saying, dude, listen. That, that's in the original Greek, I think, too. Dude, you know, she's, saying, she's really, if, if there's something that satisfies at this level, I want to know about it. I want to experience it. And so Jesus, he's got the open door now, right? He's got a clear shot. He's saying, okay, okay, if you really want to know what you're longing for, if you want to begin to understand for the first time in your life why you're so thirsty, like chronically thirsty all the time, at, not just a physical level, but at a, at a deep spirit level. If you want to know why everything you've ever tried in your life to put in for X has never worked and will never work, Jesus says, all right, good. Let's get to the heart of it, okay? Let's get underneath all the superficial and get at the core. And then what he does is he begins to take the conversation in a very personal direction. He begins to expose some stuff in her life, as you're going to see. But it's so important to understand this. Jesus doesn't bring up this stuff from her past in order to embarrass her in order to condemn her or beat her up for her past. He's, he's trying to lead her to a point of understanding and a, and a decision of faith for the first time in her life so that she can experience a true relationship with God. You see, up to this point, she's just experienced a religion. Not, 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 she's never known that a true relationship with God could ever be possible. He wants to lead her to the place of the only source of true joy, peace, happiness, love, and hope. The only source of true Lasting satisfaction. So Jesus says, we're going we're gonna to get right on it right now. Go call your husband and come back. And she says, um, I don't know. I don't have a husband. And Jesus already knew this, of course. He says, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you have now, the man you're living with now, the man you're being intimate with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Isn't it interesting, though? Jesus intentionally comes to her. He intentionally went through Samaria, even though most Jewish people would have avoided that region and those people like the plague. He came to her just like he comes to all of us at Christmas, that first Christmas in Bethlehem, and he wants her to see, just like he wants to help all of us see, 
So many times we're looking in the wrong places to satisfy and fill that emptiness we have in our hearts. Listen, we all want the same thing. We're just, we're going about it and we're looking for it in the wrong places, Jesus is saying. And then as you might expect, as Jesus brings this up, it gets a little too personal for it. It's becoming quite uncomfortable. We can understand if we were there talking to Jesus, we'd probably feel the same way. And, and so she's like, how on earth does this guy know everything about me? This is blowing her mind, or she can't quite get it. She's so hungry and so interested, but she, she backs off, right? She, she gets close. Sometimes people do that. They get really close to Jesus, and they just back off because they're a little afraid of what it might mean. They don't want to go all in yet. They just want to, just enough of Jesus to satisfy the curiosity, but she backs off, and she begins to lead Jesus in a different direction. You can read that on your own. But she tries to lead him to a worship debate. This was part of the division between the two nations. The Jews in the south said, uh, Judah said, yeah, you've got to worship God in Jerusalem in his temple. And they're like, the Samaritans were like, nope, we worship on Mount Gerizim. We, we, we're over here. That's our heritage. And again, a, another point to just hate each other all the more for that. But finally, she ends up saying, hey, you know, he, he, he's, he, he gives her the real, the real definition of worship, right? And basically, Jesus is saying in there, if you read that on your own, he's saying, listen, our Father, the Father longs for a relationship with you to where it's not about worshiping Him in a certain way, in a certain place. You can worship, you can have a relationship with God. You can be so close to God, you can worship Him anywhere, right? And she's like, I, I don't understand that. And she says, well, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when He comes, I know He'll explain everything to us. And can you imagine the impact on her? Can you imagine the awe and the amazement she experiences as Jesus looks in their eye and says, I, I, the one speaking to you, am he. <laughs> I'm the one you're longing for. I'm the, I, do you hear that? Jesus saying, hey, hey, wake up. I'm the one you're looking for. It's me. I'm X. <laughs> I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the one who alone can satisfy the deepest longing and the deepest desire of your heart. I'm I'm the only one who can fill that void and that emptiness in your heart that you're running around like crazy, stuffing your life with all this stuff. Listen, I just, I just want to remind you, there will never be a perfect enough Christmas on this earth. There will never be a perfect meal. There will never be a perfect family picture. There will never be a perfect gathering at the perfect time under a perfect tree. There will never be a perfect enough present. There'll never be a perfect enough family vacation. There'll never be um, a perfect enough friendship. Even as good as all those things are, listen, every one of those things will leave us eventually and leave us thirsting for more. They'll leave us more hungry than ever. There will never be a house. There'll never be a job. There'll never be a status. There'll never be a possession that you can get your hands on. This world advertises so, so enthusiastically that this is it. There will never be a promotion. There'll never be a relationship. There'll never be a car. There'll never be an adventure. There'll never be a drink. There'll never be a pill. There will never be a sexual encounter, no matter how good. In fact, nothing this world ever offers us as the answer and holds up as a solution and promises it will satisfy. Nothing will ever satisfy you. Nothing will ever fulfill that longing, that nagging, that I believe every person has in their heart, every one of us has experienced, I'm convinced. Nothing will satisfy that feeling. Some, something is missing. Nothing except Jesus. Except Jesus. A guy named Augustine, some of you may have heard this quote by him. A guy named Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O God. You've made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless. Some of you have come to know Christ in past years. Do you remember that feeling of restlessness? That feeling of longing, that feeling of emptiness, that uh, something's missing, but I remember that so well. I thought I had it all together. I thought all this stuff I was cramming my life with was satisfying, and I would have I never admitted anything differently. Man, I was so restless. I was so empty. I was so inside, and I was miserable. You've made us for yourself, O oh God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Listen, only Jesus can satisfy the deepest desires, the deepest longing of our heart. Well, I love the turning point in this story. Finally, this woman's eyes are opened up wide. The blinders come off for the first time, and it's incredible. Her heart is opened wide to this gift that Jesus offers her, and 
Her life is completely, I'm telling you, completely transformed. You say, well, how do you know for sure? Well, when the disciples get back from their little Taco Bell run, you know, in town, their little, their little lunch run, because they were so hungry, um, she runs off into town, and she begins to tell everyone she could find. She t- began to tell them about this man named Jesus and what she experienced in that conversation, and that come meet a man who told me everything I ever did, and he, he knows everything about me is the implication, but he loves me anyway. Come, can you meet this? Could this be the Messiah, she says? And I want to sum it all up with this right here. She tells some people, they, many of them put their faith in Jesus because of what she said. Then they go find Jesus and they invite him to stay two more days and he teaches them and shares with them and many, many more put their faith in him. This is what they say to the woman in the end. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. In other words, we're not confused anymore what the answer is. We're not We're not confused about what the missing piece is. Now we've heard for ourselves, I love this, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. (laughs) We know that this man is the Savior of the world. And here's where it comes to for us. If you truly want to have a different life, if you want to have a different Christmas this year, if you want to have a different life, my goodness, if you want to have a different eternity, this is the point of belief. This is the step of faith every one of us need to take, if we haven't already, to come to this point of believing and acting upon the belief that this man really is the Savior of the world. And you want to hear the best news of all? You want to hear what makes Christmas so awesome? He's not just the Savior of the world. He can be your Savior. Amen? He's not just the Savior of the world. I, he's my Savior. I remember when that happened. And, and all these years later, I still can't get over what he's done in my life and the difference he makes and how drastically different life is because of him. That's the good news of Christmas. Now, you may be sitting there and you may be thinking this morning, okay, okay, Pastor, I, I've been to church enough times. I've I know where you're headed with all this. I know uh, you're going to give us an opportunity to make a decision. And, and I'll admit, Pastor Mark, I have some empty places in my life. I have some thirsty places in my life that I've been trying to fill. I realize that. But Pastor Mark, are you telling me, are you really telling me that if I enter into a relationship with Jesus by faith, if I put my trust in him, if I, if I come home to him this Christmas, and, and more than that, if I actually ask him by faith to come make his home in me and live in me through the Holy Spirit, are you saying there is a satisfaction that totally eclipses every other thing that I've ever tried in my life to find satisfaction in? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. <laughs> yes. That is exactly what I'm telling you because that's exactly what God has told us through his word, okay? It's exactly what it is. And I mean, and I want to tell people who are sometimes skeptical, who sometimes get close to God, they'll come to church, they'll hear these services, and then they'll pull back. And they're like, no, not, not yet. I want to tell some of those people, maybe even some of you listening online right now, I want to say, what have you got to lose? You've tried everything else, right? You've chased after all the toys and, and the money and the relationships and the food and whatever else this world promises you. That this year it'll be, you know, and, and we cling to that. You've tried all that. Has it satisfied? No, it has not. Why not try Jesus? Why not come to him? Why not put your faith in him and just, just see, just see if he is not faithful and he will not do everything he claimed to do and see if he's not everything he said he was. You know, I've been, um, I've had the joy and the, it really is a privilege to preach these Christmas messages for nearly 20 years now. Can you, I just can't believe that. This is my 19th Christmas, 19th Christmas as a pastor preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus at Christmas time. And I love it. I really do because people's hearts are typically more open than ever this time of year than they are at any other time to spiritual truth. And I just love, I, the best thing, I love seeing the light come on for people. I love seeing people come home to the Lord. But in all the time, in all the people that I've talked to about Jesus from this platform and in personal conversations, you know what? I've never had one single person who's ever come home to the Lord and make that decision. I've never had one person say, you know, that it was good, but I wish I had waited longer. 
I, I, I remember that time and it was good, but I wish I had put it off a few weeks or months or years. That was just too soon. I wish I'd put the, no, nobody says that. Nobody says that. But I have heard the testimony of hundreds and hundreds of people who have said, I don't understand it all. I'm still growing in my faith. I, I still have a long way to go. But because of Jesus, I, because of that decision of faith, I have a peace and I have a joy like I've never known. A lot of people just say life just makes more sense now to me. I, I have a true purpose in life. You say, does that really happen anymore? Do people still, does it still happen like it happened for this lady at the well? Absolutely. I was talking to a dear sister in the Lord who's a very vital part of this church family. Her name's Shauna. Her and her family have become so dear to us. We love them so much. And I just marvel at what God has done in her life. And I pulled her aside on Wednesday on the other side of the building and I just said, can you tell me again how this, I told her what I was preaching on. I said, can you tell me how that worked for you? And, and we just need her to come up and preach a service some Sunday. It was incredible. I wish I'd recorded it. But the, the summary of it all was there was a time in her life, she came from a very broken and a very painful home, a home where drugs were introduced into her life at a very young age. And she became addicted. And she, and she gave me permission to share all this, of course. And she became addicted, and she began to chase after those things, and she became enslaved to those things. And she said, I didn't even know different. I just thought that, that was, doing drugs was as normal as, as anything that any other family did. It was just a normal part of our life. I really didn't know there was another life. But she said, I always had a hunger for God deep down, in, for something. And even as a child, I somehow, some way, if my family wanted nothing to do with it, I always found myself in church. We moved around a lot. That lifestyle kind of strings you out all over the place, you know. And she said, but somehow, someway, wherever I was, I, somehow a friend would invite me. And I would always say yes. I wanted to be in church. But then we would move, and I would never, I would never get deep. I would never establish those relationships. She began to grow up, and she began to become more addicted. And it began to have devastating consequences. It began to break her own home and, and, and be, lead her to become very desperate and, and seek after other things and she had a daughter, and she ended up for a time because of the drugs and all that being separated from her daughter. And she said, I, I just absolutely came to a breaking point. I, I couldn't take it. I, I had to figure out what the missing piece was. And she didn't pray an elaborate prayer. There was no hallelujah chorus. She, she just said, I came to that moment where I just said, God, I'm done with all this. And I want to come home. And in that moment, there and then, she had a lot of growing to do. She had a lot of, but she knew, she knew something had shifted. She said, I knew, I love this. She said, I knew I was never going back. Just this past Wednesday, she said, I knew I was never going back. There was other people that looked into my life and said, oh, no, don't, don't get too optimistic now. There's lots of people like you who fall back. She said, I, I'm telling you, it's not because of me. Something's different because of him. And she came home, and it changed everything, and she was radically saved, and the fruit began to show in her life. And I just love, absolutely love seeing living, breathing illustrations of exactly what we're talking about here in this passage. So if you're wondering, can it happen, and does it happen? Absolutely. It happens all the time here, amen, because the Lord's at work here, and I believe it can happen here today. Some of you may be wondering who this Jesus is. Let me just tell you, Jesus is all that satisfies you. Jesus is the living water that you're looking for. And if you're here this morning or you're watching with our online church family and you're wondering, I would like to do that. I, I realize this is what I need and I don't want to go another Christmas without it. How do I come home? How do I begin a relationship with God? Well, I just, I believe I'm an advocate for keeping things as simple as possible. If it's simple enough for me to understand, surely other people can understand too because I'm just a simple, I need it basic for me. Here's the most basic invitation from scripture I could find, Romans 10, 13. It simply says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And? No, no, no and. That's it. You call on the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Do I have to, do I have to join the church? Do I have to say a bunch of, do I have to go through a catechism? Do I have to go through a class? No. You just call on the Lord, right? You, he knows your heart. You say, well, I don't even know what to say. Listen, it's, it's much less about the words. He's much less interested with your words than he is your heart. You call on the Lord, and here's the promise of God right here in print. You will be saved. You will be saved. So I believe 
there's some people here this morning, I believe there's some people online, God's been pursuing you, God's been drawing you. He's using these words to cause the blinders to fall off, to bring you to an awareness, perhaps for the first time in your life, or yet again, to say, I know what I need. I, and some of you are at that point this morning where you're saying, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to come home. So I want to help you do that. Would you bow your heads this morning? Would you just close your eyes and, and, and just allow other people to have the the privilege of really focusing on the Lord this morning. Today, if you're ready to come home, I want to help you do that. I want to lead you in a prayer. But again, it's not about praying these exact words, and it's not me praying for you. Only you can make this decision for yourself. Only you can call upon the Lord, and only you can be experiencing His salvation and His forgiveness. But I want to pray a prayer. And it's just simply an expression of you calling upon the Lord with sincerity. Now, let me say one more thing very quickly as your heads are bowed. This isn't calling on the Lord. This isn't a casual thing. This isn't like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, a little, I'm a little empty, I'm a little dry, and maybe this will help for a moment, and I, I feel kind of guilty for some of the things I've done, and maybe this will help take the edge off, and I'll, yeah, sure, I'll call upon the Lord. We'll just see what happens. It's not like that. This is like a drowning person in a raging torrent calling on someone to save them because the Bible's very clear about this. We are... Apart from Christ, we are drowning in our sin. We have no hope apart from Christ. We have, there's nothing that we can do to get ourselves out of that. And if we die apart from Christ, we die eternally. It's that serious. So it's with that sincerity and that seriousness that this is talking. To call upon the Lord say, I, I realize I need to be saved. I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness, God. And I'm calling upon you because I believe you are the Savior of the world. That's what we're talking about, okay, today. And if God has brought you to that point, if the Holy Spirit has got his hand in your back right now, and this is for you, why don't we all pray this together this morning so we don't make anybody feel like they're sticking out and embarrassed. Well, that's not our goal here today. But why don't we all pray it? Whether you prayed this many, many years ago or many times before, let's pray it together, okay? Father God, I'm calling upon you today taking you at your word. I'm calling to you for forgiveness. I'm calling to you to save me. I can't save myself, God. I'm lost without you. I have no hope apart from you. But I believe you are the Savior of the world. I believe you gave your life for me. And I believe you rose again in victory from the grave. Save me now. Help me to follow you and serve you all the days of my life. I pray this in faith, in the mighty name of Jesus, my Savior. Amen. Now keep your heads bowed for one more minute, okay, please? This is very, very important. This is important as the step of faith you took because the Bible says now a journey has begun. Now a new life has begun for you. You're born again. And the reality is we need help on this journey. The woman at the well, when she experienced this transformation, you notice what she did. She went and told everybody. She, told, she couldn't contain it. This thing that God had done in her heart and this family she was now a part of. We're not going to make you stand up and come to a microphone and tell everybody, but it's important to acknowledge it this morning. So with everybody's head bowed still, just quickly, we want to put some resources in your hand. If you made that decision today, if you took that step of faith, there's a CD in there, there's a Bible, there's a card in there just to fill out so we can continue to encourage you and pray for you. This is very, very important. Don't neglect this if you made this commitment. So very quickly, just know we're not going to embarrass you, but if you made that commitment today, would you be so bold to slip up your hand right where you're at? Just right where you're at. Anybody at all, we want to put a bag in your hand. We want to give you these resources so you can continue the joy of following Jesus and growing to maturity. If you did that online, would you reach out to our online church pastors right now? They're ready to help you and send you. We have an MP3 file. We can send you of what I'm talking about that is in these bags. Anyone else? Anyone here at all? Praise God. Praise God. One right here. We don't leave anybody out. I, I came home today, Pastor Mark. Realized what was missing for the first time. Anybody else? 
All right. Praise the Lord. Can we just give the Lord a thanks and a, and, a, and, a, and a gratitude for His work? Still at work, still seeking people, drawing them to Himself, still inviting people to come home to Him. Well, let's stand to our feet. I want to share this blessing with you. Then I want to invite you back at 5 o'clock tonight. We'll be live streaming this as well. So our online church, online church family, come back and join us as well. And send that link out. Send that invitation out to whoever you can find or think of. Please invite someone. There's still people that want to experience this. So maybe they haven't heard about it. So let them know. There's cards out there. You can uh, take them as well. So let me, let me share this blessing with you. May our risen Savior... The one who came at Christmas time, may he fill you to overflowing with true hope and peace and love and joy, both at Christmas time and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Would you, you have a blessed day. Encourage each other as you go, okay? God bless you.